It's anytime you grab or bring a group of people together, you have an ecclesia. It can be for political purposes. It can be for anything. It's a gathering. But in the New Testament, it has a different meaning. But when we're talking about it, it's not the building. Let's go to church. What's church? It's that building down the street. Really? No. It has nothing to do with a building. You can meet in a tent. You can meet in a house. Most of the New Testament churches were in the homes. It doesn't matter. That's not what it is. It's not an organization or denomination. It's not the Southern Baptist. It's not the Assembly of God. It's, it's not the Church of God. It's not the Catholic Church. Those are just huge organizations. But it's not the church. Now there is a distinction between a universal church and the local church. Anybody that is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ who has trusted Him as the Savior is part of the church. But there's another folks when people come together in a gathering, there's a kind of a localized gathering. Two or more are gathered together in my name. I'm there in your midst. You got a church. It's not a country club. I've been to church. I know one in Hot Springs in particular. It's a country club almost. You know, we went there for a while. You know, it was a place of the elite, and they were different from the church over around the corner, and they do everything. But uh, it, it, was, it was kind of disheartening. It was kind of, you're not a country club. You're not a community center. Sometimes Baptist churches are big community centers. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that, having a lot of programs and having, you know, uh, a big uh, gymnasiums and all those type things. I, I'm not opposed to those. They attract people in. But don't lose your f- focus. Don't lose your focus. What are you? We're believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Gather together to help w- do what? Help us each worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Be closer as a family. It's not a political organization, a patriotic gathering. I want you to be, I want you to vote. I want you to be responsible citizens. I want you to be stewards. This world, we're, we're part of the community. But, you know, Republican Party, Democratic Party, uh, Tea Party, all those type things, that's not the church. Don't confuse them. One of the problems in the world right now is they are making that con- Republican Party is a Christian church. No, it's not. I don't claim them to represent me. I might align with them in certain contexts, certain ideas, but they're not my representation of my Christianity. What happens, sometimes they become one of these groups or political groups begin to be kind of a representative and all of a sudden they might not represent you, but you're all of a sudden classified with that group and you, you can't get anywhere with anybody outside of that. The focus still is Jesus Christ. It's not your political issues. Do I have political issues? Yes! Strong political issues. I'm really upset right now with the American Civil Liberties Union. They, no, the American, uh, what is it, Separation of Church and State, uh, the, the, I can't remember the name of the organization. They sent me a letter threatening me not to take a position on a political, they don't have a right to tell me what to say up here. You don't tell me if they say, you, remember you are not allowed to endorse a, a political candidate. You know, you lose your tax exemption. Really? Well, if I'm really opposed to a person to the degree that I think, that I think he's representative of the Antichrist or something, believe me, I'm going to say so. I don't believe that right now, and I'm not going to say it, and I'm not going to, I think you're smart enough to decide yourself in these areas. But I don't like them threatening me for it. But we are not a political organization. Sometimes churches can be so big, every time you walk in the door, they got the American flag up that you associate churchianity with American patriotism. And we have to be careful of that, especially as a military church. We ought to honor a Memorial Day. We ought to represent, be, be 
and love with our country. But you know what? I am an American and I'm a Christian. I'm not ashamed of that. But if I'm going to choose one or the other, I'm going to be a Christian first. And that is universal and that is eternal. I'm not always going to be an American. But I'll always be a Christian. So I don't put my Americanism before my Christianity. I put my Christianity before my American patriotism. New Testament ecclesia is people who believe in God. I'm just going to go through these real quick. Believe in Jesus, have fellowship, fellowship in God's Word, committed prayer and care for one another, evangelize, practice the ordinances, and bab- ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Let me just go through these quickly. Believe in God. People say, I believe in God. Which God? What God do you believe in? Say, so what do you mean, what God do I believe in? There's all kinds of gods out there. Even in the New Testament, there are all kinds. There were Baal, and there were Moloch, and, the, you know, coming out of Egypt, Elohim. I believe in God the Creator. Creator of heaven and earth. Now, whether you want to hold to a day-age theory or Big Bang theory, anything like that, that's not the point. The point is, do you believe in a God that is bigger than the universe, separate from the universe, who created the universe? He existed before the foundation of the world. There was a time before time started, because he also started time, because he is outside of the context of time. He was the only thing that was. And he's the only thing that can exist is the only thing that is or the only thing that was. And out of his desire, and out of his will, he said, let there be. And there was. Most of the world religions don't believe that. Judaism, Christianity, Islam. But I'm not convinced Allah is Elohim. Even though the name Allah, Allah, here's the word, Allah, all you have to do is put it in there, Im, Allah, Im, it actually has some of the same root as Elohim. People don't understand that. So to the Islamic view, Elohim and Allah are the same. The Im is a, is a masculine connection to it. But the characteristics are different. The attributes are different. There are too many things that are different. And even though it is the God who created all There's distinctions, big distinctions, and you need to know those distinctions. But beyond that, if you get into Hinduism, I had someone once tell me, all religions are the same, they all worship God. Really? Hinduism has over two million gods. They have Brahma, but Brahma is the all in all. The the world and the, the universe and God are one. You can't destroy the universe and still have God. You destroy the universe, you've destroyed God. I said, not this big is your God. So what do you have to believe in? I think that is a fundamental, foundational verse. It's at the bottom of the Scripture, the very beginning of the Scripture. Everything is built on it. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Is that the God you believe in? Then you're on the right track. That's only the start, though. The second is this. Believe in Jesus. True New Testament church, you believe in Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His only begotten son. I had someone say, we're all sons of God. Yeah, and Adam, we're all sons of God. I said, but that's not what he's saying here. This one is the only begotten son of God born in Mary. He's different. He's unique. He's the only one that way to salvation. There is no other way of salvation. Christians are always always look down upon because you're too exclusive. Well, yeah, I'm exclusive. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. Listen, if, if somebody hung my kid on a cross, would I be receptive to him? Somebody, if I have a kid and you want to get to me, 
You need to get to me through my kid. You know, I mean, seriously. You don't believe in my kid, why should I, I care whether you believe in me or not? So beat up my kid, throw my kid out, and hang him on a cross, or defame him, or profane him. I'm going to be mad at you. He's, the Bible says, this is his son. He gave his only son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting. Do you believe in this son? Not some Jesus you made up. Not some Christ in your own image. Not some that conforms to what you want him to be. But the Christ of the Bible. There's a difference. New Age movement. Christ consciousness. You just have to have the Christ. There are many Christs. You know, you can be Christ too. Oh, really? You just have to have the Christ consciousness. No. There's only one Christ, Messiah. It's it. Don't fudge on this. Don't back off of this. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. How? Believing in Him. Trusting in Him. Believing that He is the Son of God, that He came to die for your sins because you were a sinner. You've got to believe in sin. You have to believe in the authority of the Scriptures. You have to believe that Jesus Christ is the answer. That He died for your sins. He didn't come to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Whoever believes in Him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe in Him is condemned already. Because He has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. That's pretty clear to me. Here's the problem. Jesus came to save the world. Jesus is coming back to judge the world. Second time around isn't going to be as pretty. It's not going to be. At that time, the world will be judged on the basis of whether they believed in him or not. That should tell you to be doing something. What's that? Telling people about it. Some will reject, some will receive. Some sitting in here today probably don't believe. No matter how much you might want to believe, you just cannot make yourself believe. I pray that's not the case. Believe in Jesus, that he's the only begotten son, that he's the only access to the Father, that he died on the cross for the forgiveness of sins, that he was resurrected from the dead and intercedes in behalf of the believer, that we have eternal life through him. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? That's basically most of those, those creeds, those the Nicene Creed, the... Almost all of them say the same thing. And it's basically this. That he is coming again. I might add that he sends a comforter while he's not here. Uh, the paraclete, the paracleo, that resides in each one of us. If you have Christ, you have the Spirit, by the way. It's not some second thing that's giving. You have him. You've been sealed by him. There's a mark on you. you. You have him. He's there. Believe in Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. What the, the focus here is grace. It's grace. What is grace? Grace is a gift. Undeserved gift. You did nothing. You didn't do anything. You believed it. That's it. That's all faith is. You believed it. Now, is that something that you do? No, not really. You just, you either believe or you don't believe. You step on an airplane. You know, I walk into a restaurant. And, 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 you know, every time you go into a restaurant, you have an awful lot of faith in the cook. I never see the cook hardly unless it's one of those where they, you know, you order a hamburger. You don't know if that guy's back there taking that hamburger patty and going like that. Seriously, you put faith in people all the time. You've found a few hairs in that hamburger, have you? <laughs> That's pretty gross. You have second thoughts next time you go to Burger King or McDonald's or someplace. <laughs> Every time you get on an airplane, most of the time you'll get to meet the pilot. You have faith in that pilot. There are facts behind your faith. You see planes go up. You see planes come down. You see planes go up. You see planes. You see people getting out of the plane. You see the steward. And so, you know, they've been there. Or if you've flown before, you, 
it's easier to have the faith, but you still got faith. Everybody has faith to some degree. The question is, where do you put faith here? Faith, but faith is not anything of your own doing. It's the grace of God that's the focal point here. For by grace, it's a gift. You either receive the gift or you don't receive. You either, he hands it out, and you either, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, I don't want that. Or you say, I really want that. And you take it. But you do it on his terms. Not in your terms. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And it's not of your own doing. It's not something you do. It's a gift. A gift of God. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. Notice what Paul says here. He doesn't want you boasting about it. God doesn't. You, you go before him. Why shall I let you into my heaven? Well, look at all the good works I did. Sorry. That's not it. That's not it. Did you see the gift that I gave you through my son? Uh, no, but I was a good person. No, that's not it. The gift is eternal life through my son. Did you receive that? If you received that, you got eternal life. That's it. It's so simple. It's so hard for some to receive. For we are his workmanship. Notice what he didn't do it, he didn't do it for no reason at all. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. God didn't bring you in and have you receive and have you sensitive to the Spirit to take the gift that now you just sit on your can and do nothing to be a spectator. You're part of the fellowship. You are part of the church. You are a priest. You are a priest. You have access before the throne. You don't need some other priest for you. You don't need me. You can go before the throne. Jesus Christ is the high priest. He is your means to the throne. The curtain's been torn. There's no priesthood except you. You're all saints. You don't have to be good works and be announced by the church as a saint, you are a saint. You've been set apart with a purpose. Unto good works. Do good works. You don't do good works to get into heaven. You have been accepted by God into heaven that you might do good works. You get it? You don't have to do anything to... You don't do good works to receive the gift. You receive the gift... Because God has now planned that now that you receive the gift, you are now equipped to do good works. I love it. I expect you to do good works. But no more than God expects you to do good works. Because you got the gift. For we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. You've been, you're a new creation. You know what you once were. You're different. You're separate. You're unique. Which God prepared beforehand. He prepared it for you a long time ago. All things work together for those who love God. To those who have been called according to His purpose. Someone asked me, and I told you all this before, you've been called to ministry? I said, have you? No, you, you've been called to be a preacher? Have you? What do you mean? Well, it says here, all things work together for those who love God to those who have been called. Whoa! Are you a Christian? You've been called. Uh-oh. Called to do what? I might not know what I've been called to do. Right now, I'm called to be pastor of this church. Tomorrow, God might call me to do something else. I don't know what He's calling me to do. I just do what God calls me to do. And it's the same as true for you. And what we should be doing here is helping one another to know that calling. To see your giftedness. That we should walk in them. Fellowship of the saints. Fellowship in God's Word. Preaching of God's Word. The study of God's Word. 
Let's go back. Study of God's Word. Preach here. You need to be studying God's Word. You can't know His calling for you unless you're in the Word. I believe in this, but you know, we come together, I hope that all of you in here respect this. Believe in the authority of it. Believe it is as relevant to you today as when it was written. That you study the context of it, you recognize that you know, it's a little different. Uh, I mean, you're speaking directly to individuals in the epistles, but you know what? These are universal principles. Do I need to know the context in which it is written? Yeah, I would be studying the context. I need to understand the historical context, all these type of things. But I want to be in the Word. Be in the Word. Be in the Word. Read it. Read it. Read it. Read it. Read it. Do you always understand? No. There's times I've been in the Bible, I've read and read, and it is dry, and I'm in the desert, and sometimes it just doesn't. Just doesn't say anything to me. Usually, it's not the word that's the problem. Usually, it's here, right here, with me. And I pray, God, help me get out of the dryness, get out of the desert. If I just keep reading it, studying it, it comes back. Sometimes the circumstances of life make it dry. We want to find answers in money or occupation or something else, and all of a sudden doesn't seem to have any meaning to us because the problem is we've gone to another God. And those gods are speaking to us more than this God. We need to have fellowship in the Word, study the Word. we got some decent teachers here. Sean's a good teacher. Dennis is a great teacher. I really appreciate that I'm not the only one teaching. My daughter's a good teacher. Charlotte, and some of you can be teaching the little ones, teaching, but be in the Word. Commit to prayer and care for one another. Corporate prayer, private prayer, pray, 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 pray. Jesus, do you think Jesus thought prayer was important? He's in, he's, Still interceding on our behalf to the Father. Prayer is important. Has prayer changed things in this church? I think Steve is still alive because of prayer. I think Carrie, who had that tumor, and you know, it's come back, by the way, she said the other day. It's but we need to keep praying. Don't quit. Persistent, persistent. Never give up on prayer. But don't pray when you can do something. Care. Care. Care for one another. It doesn't do any good if you've, got, if you've got the means of helping somebody and they come to you. James says this, if you can help somebody, you have the means and the resources and say, I'll pray for you. And then send them off. We care for one another. What is a what is ecclesia? New Testament ecclesia. It's praying for one another. It's caring for one another. Being in a word with one another. But it's one another. It's not this building. It's not the local church down the road. It's people who believe in God, believe in Jesus Christ, and believe in one another. You know what? Do you believe in the gathering? I hear people preaching the tithe all the time or give to the church. Don't give to the organization. Give to the body. I want you to give because you can't hold up if you don't. It takes the care means giving. Give it yourself. Whoops, my watch. All this ought to be evangelism, sharing our faith with others. Personal evangelism. When you're out on the street or walking in the malls, or number one, the first thing you do in evangelism is just be a good Christian. Don't curse out the guy driving down the road. You know, be different. Have people see you as someone that's not like everybody else. 
not not in your external components, you know, holy this movement where you're dressed down to your ankles and you're here in a bun and all that type. So that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the internal qualities that just flow out of your soul that people see. That they can tell there's something different about you. What is it? Why are you different? And then be willing to tell them about it. When they ask you, that's where you need to be in the Word of God so that you can share with them, answer questions. Well, that's part of lifestyle evangelism. Outreach ministry. Programs are good. Hey, at ease. How many ladies come walking into this church that never would come to church otherwise? You know, how many homeschool program ministries or so? A lot of, not all homeschoolers are necessarily Christians, but they're looking for a, a place where they can teach their kids. And these type ways, these, these are ways of reaching the community. But they can't be an in and of themselves. They ought to always have the component of evangelism involved in it and sharing the faith. And sometimes when people get into a community of believers and they feel comfortable and then they start to listen and they begin to hear, and they begin to believe. You can share your faith. Some of you are scared to death to share your faith. It's not hard. Just be yourself and, and share what you believe. Inviting others to hear the good news. Using literature and other forms of communication. Be careful with tracks. Don't, don't go into a restaurant and leave a lousy tip and hand a track on the table. That's offensive, you know. I mean, seriously. I mean, you're going to leave a track, it's okay, but make sure you tip the waitress really good when you do it. You know. uh, I, had, I had a time period, one time I, I was in Dallas, I went into a, um, I think it was a jack-in-the-box. It was Evangelism Week at Dallas Theological Seminary where I went to school. And I bought something in the window and I gave a little for spiritual loss track in the window. And, and the girl said, thank you. And she gave me a hamburger. I left about a month later. It may have been longer than that. I come through the window again to buy something. The lady girl said to me, are you the one that gave me that little booklet? And I said, yeah, I think I was. And she said, I had to think twice because I had them out all over the place. I, I think I was. She says, I really appreciated that. Do you have any more of those? I want to hand them out to my friends. Wow. I was surprised. You know why? Because I hate to go into a restroom and find one sitting on the, the toilet dispenser or something. That's gaudy, you know. You're some tact with it. And, and when you hand it to somebody, don't, you know, have a smiley face. You know, be, be sincere with it or something. Uh, but I use Facebook to some degree to reach out to people and have conversations with people. and there's, there's different ways. Okay, let's move along. What have we looked at so far? You are the church. And you know what's neat? There are people all over the world right now who are meeting in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what? They're part of the same universal church. Different time periods, you know, whether they meet on Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday evening. Time zones are all different. Some of them met five or six hours ago, some other place in the world. But we have a connection. We have a connection with people in India and in China and Korea. We have a connection with people in North Africa, South Africa. We have connections with all the persecuted people. We have a connection not only with that, but we have a connection with all the people who have ever lived that believed in Jesus Christ. We have a fellowship on a universal scale. But you know what? I can't do something for all of those out there. I can. I can be involved in missions and send money out and be a part of it. But you know what? I can do something right here. You know what's so exciting? Oh, I'm so excited. Most of you aren't going to be around here for long. You say, what? <laughs> I'm excited because we're sending you out. You are going out and you're going to share the gospel somewhere else. And we have our fingers penetrated all over the world. This little church, 
I know you get frustrated sometimes, Pat and Johnny, that, that people come and go so much. But this church has an impact in every country of the world just about. Think about that. We send guys to Afghanistan. We send guys to Iraq. We send guys to Kuwait. We send, you know, families, and, and then they're, they're here for two years or whatever, and all of a sudden they're in Kansas. Wow! If we had, we had an impact on you, these two, are, they're leaving soon. Going to Kansas. Man, we're going to miss you. These two are going to be probably leaving in February, you know. After March. After March. You guys are leaving in December. I could just go on with each one of you. But you know what? You're still connected here. I'm sorry. It hurts every time somebody leaves. But this is God's calling for us. And it's part. We have to focus on the universal church because we don't function very well as a local church. <laughs> We can't even have a constitution that works because every time we get a deacon, they go away, you know. We try to have memberships or something and, well, they're here for a little while and they're gone, you know. So it's hard to know how to function on that. But that, that's the way it is. It's okay. You know what? That was the early church. Did you hear me? The early church was scattered. They didn't stay very long. They were scattered all over the world. We're more like the early church. That ought to through your heart. What is baptism? Once. Believers. We're a Baptist church. You know why they call us Baptists? Because you have to believe to be baptized. That's what it means. That's the simplest terms. You're not baptized as an infant. We believe in believe, believer's baptism. The word baptism, by the way, means to dip. That's what it means. So we dip. We don't pour water over your head. We don't sprinkle you as a baby. You don't know what's going on as a baby. It's not a confirmation. It's not, a, uh, it, it, it's not equivalent to circumcision, which is why most of those do. They think it's replaced circumcision. Now, will I pour water over somebody's head if I can't dip them? You know, yeah. Yeah, if, if there's no water available, if I was in the middle of a desert and somebody wanted to be baptized and all we had was a quart of water, then we're going to dip it over your head. But, but if we can immerse you, we'll immerse you. But what is it? Baptism is not your salvation. Baptism is a symbol of what's already happened. When you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, You've entered into the sphere of Christ. You've been, you're automatic, you've already been baptized. You've been baptized into the spiritual realm of Christ. What, so why do we do this for? We're told to do it. It's an imperative. You ought to do it. Why should you do it? Because you are making a profession of faith to the people around you. You are preaching a sermon. You are saying, I identify myself with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I want people to know it. It's a form of evangelism. It's a form of confession. It's a form of, but is it what saves you? No. It's a symbol. It's a picture of something that has already taken place on the inside. Have you trusted in Jesus Christ as your Savior? And... You haven't been baptized? Maybe it's time to be baptized. You know, we'll baptize you. What's the requirement? Believe that the Lord Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the Scripture and on the third day rose from the dead and that believing you have eternal life. And you want to say to the community, I want to identify with all of you and with Jesus Christ. That's what baptism is. It's all it is. But it's it's commanded of us. It's only done once. It's your identification with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. In some countries, you can profess Jesus Christ. In, in India, you can say, I believe in Jesus. Sure, why not? He's just one of the other gurus. 
There's thousands of you. There are many ways into the God. But when you get baptized, you've made a statement in those cultures that you're identifying with that and that alone. And then families, families might throw you out or whatever. Because you have made a statement of commitment. The ordinance of baptism. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. I think this particular verse is talking about that, that spiritual baptism that takes place. That all of us, when you came to Christ, you were all baptized. Whether you're a Jew or a Greek or slaves or free, and all were made to drink of the one spirit. It happened when you were saved. This one speaks more to the physical baptism. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? There's a physical aspect of it, but there is a spiritual. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. You've made a statement and a, to the believers and now walk it. Do it. By the way, if you go under, you've died to Christ, you're brought up into the resurrection of life. The last is the ordinance, the Lord's Supper. We only have two ordinances, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Baptism doesn't save you. The Lord's Supper doesn't save you. The Lord's Supper doesn't give you anything. It's not some kind of grace that's all of a sudden you take this. You're, it's, 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 it's something that's it's important. But we do it often. We don't do it often enough around here. I keep forgetting every month. But it's special. It puts us at the table of Christ. I talked to you all about Joseph sitting out with his brothers. Notice what's going on in that table with Joseph in Genesis, with all his brothers, and a bring, bringing together that family, and there's forgiveness. There's forgiveness there. And it's focusing on something that's yet to come, the bringing together of the people, the Jewish people into Egypt. Well, the Lord is looking forward to bringing together his people as well. <laughs> It's remembrance of what Christ has done for us in his death and the new covenant. Matthew 26, 26 through 29. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. After blessing it, he broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat, this is my body. Another place in the gospel, he made this statement, I am the bread of life. Your fathers, they ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that you may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, we will live forever. Or he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for him of the world is my flesh. You say, that's odd. I don't want to get into the theology of the Lord's Supper. You know, some church teach the actual body and flesh of our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the, the bread is this, turns into the flesh of Christ. I don't believe that. It's a remembrance. This, this is figurative language here. Is it not? Manna comes down from heaven. He's taking us back to Egypt. He's taking us back to the past, before the Passover. He's talking about when the Jews are coming out of Egypt and going through the wilderness and the bread is the sustenance of life. I am your sustenance. You take this and it reminds you that I am the one that sustains you. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. You don't live by bread alone. Jesus is your bread. You live by Him. Are you grasping what He's saying here? So when we look at this, 
It is a symbol of our Christ who has died for us, who has broken for us. And we ought to do it often and regularly. And what about the wine? And he took the cup and when he had drank, given thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink of it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you and the Father's kingdom. John 15, 5, he says, I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. There is a the branches, Jesus is the vine. There's a connection here, number one, with the concept of Israel. The vine is used in the Old Testament. Jesus is our vine. We are his branches. We can do nothing without him. There's a picture of the fruit of the vine here, the wine that flows through. There's a symbol going on here again. He's taking us back, all the way back to the Exodus, all the way back to the Jewish nation, all the way back to a presentation to him. But what is he doing? He's taking us to his death. It's a new covenant. What was the old covenant? Ten commandments. What's a new covenant? A new covenant I've given to you. Love one another. Even as I have loved you, so love one another. That's the new covenant. If you do this, you fulfill all the law. You fulfilled it.